Today on the John Ankerberg Show, what will heaven be like? What has God told us about the magnificent world to come? If you've ever planned a trip to Disneyland, skiing in Aspen, or a trip to Europe, you usually look at the brochures and websites to find out in advance what it'll be like. Such guidebooks excite us about going there. But the guidebook to heaven is the Bible, and it says, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, which God has promised. But if heaven, or as the verse calls it, the new heaven and new earth, will be your home someday, what do you know about heaven? What are you looking forward to doing, to experiencing, to seeing in the place you will spend for all eternity? My guest today is best-selling author of Heaven, Dr. Randy Alcorn. He will describe the wonderful things God has promised Christians will enjoy in our future home in heaven. Join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We're talking with the leading authority on heaven in the United States, and that's Dr. Randy Alcorn. And today we're going to talk about the new Jerusalem, the city that we're all going to, to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord, and in His beautiful city. How big is this city? What are the things we're going to find in this city? And let's start, Randy, with a Bible verse here. Revelation 21.15 says, The angel who spoke to me had a golden measuring rod with which to measure the city and its foundation stones and wall." Now the city is laid out as a square, its length and width the same. He measured the city with the measuring rod at 1,400 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. Now Randy, help us get our mind around what these words are saying. Well, some people say they're symbolic and they say, well, it's a cube. It's like the Holy of Holies and, and it represents God's perfection, the three dimensions, the threefold, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, all that could be true, but then we're also told it was actually man's measurement that was being used. So certainly we should see this as a, a vast place. And it should remind us of the fact that what God has in store for us in eternity is something bigger, far, far bigger, even than what we've experienced in this life. If we understood that this life is just the beginning for the people of God, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about, gee, uh, have I passed my peak? Uh, do, do I need to have a bunch of things on my bucket list? Because this is my one chance. This is my one shot at experiencing happiness here in a world of beauty and abundance, which tells us something about what we think of heaven. We don't have a biblical picture of heaven because the biblical picture is, as in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we're told in Revelation 21.1, God does the same thing again, except this time He creates new heavens and a new earth. He restores the old. There's continuity between them so that the new universe that we will live in will be greater through the redemptive blood of Christ. It will be greater than anything we ever experienced in this life. So the wonders of the world will be greater than anything we've ever experienced. We know there's going to be a new Jerusalem. Could there be a new Los Angeles, a new London? Could there be a new Chattanooga? I, I mean, why not? If one city is made new, why not the other cities made new? God's redemptive work to redeem culture and to reach out and to do all of these things so that we have redeemed music and we have redeemed art and we have redeemed drama and redeemed sports and the full human experience, I think we will be able to go to places, if you've never been to Niagara Falls, I have been, but there's many places I haven't been, but why not a new Niagara Falls and why not other waterfalls much bigger and far greater that will cause our hearts to worship God? Yeah, I've, I've had the privilege of traveling to bring the gospel to different countries. 
And I can remember the first time I went to Switzerland and rolled through those mountains on the trains. And I just loved seeing the mountains go by. I was to Ethiopia in, when I was 19 years of age and I stood on huge mountains and looked over areas where Life Magazine said it was one of the 10 places where civilization had not yet come to the earth. And I could listen to the sound and you couldn't hear anything mm. but nature. I've been out in the wilds of Kenya where you've seen the animals and, and you, you realize their beauty or the oceans of different parts of the world and you say, you know, if we didn't have that in heaven, I would miss that. But tell us what God is actually saying through these verses and other passages of scriptures about this new heaven and new earth, new earth that we're going to experience. We're told that even in this life, the heavens declare the glory of God. Astronomy has been a hobby of mine since I was a child. And I grew up in a non-Christian home. And I would go out, I would look through the telescope and I would see the wonders of heaven. I, I still remember the night that I first saw the great galaxy of Andromeda. And I would read about how many light years away it was and how many hundreds of millions of stars. And I remember as a sixth grader weeping, just weeping because of the vastness of the universe, but I felt like I was on the outside. I didn't know what it was all about. I'd never heard the gospel. Later on, fast forward, I'm a high schooler, uh, I'm a teenager, I come to faith in Christ, and one day I notice my telescope, which I hadn't looked through for years, over in a corner, I take it out, it's a clear night, I look up in the sky, I go to that same great galaxy of Andromeda, and I weep again, but this time for a different reason. The reason I wept was that, yes, it is so great and so vast, but now I know the God who created it. Now I am in a, in a relationship with that God of wonders who created all the galaxies and the nebula and the black holes and the quasars and the wonders of the universe, and now I know him. Talk about the fact that God loves us so much that he's already designed us with certain desires and likes. He's gonna destroy all the bad stuff in us. He's gonna enhance the good stuff in us. That means the things that we like, he's not gonna destroy that either. He's gonna enhance that. Everything's going to be enhanced because he's a loving God. That's right. All right? And therefore, this new earth that he's preparing for us, he already knows what we like. He already knows the things that we have desires for. Why? Because he gave them to us, and he's going to fulfill those. And then he says it's going to be beyond anything that we can even dream about. Hmm. Pascal, the great mathematician and, and scientist, said, All men seek happiness. That is built into our nature to seek happiness. It is something that comes from God. The problem is not that we seek happiness. The problem is we seek happiness in the wrong places. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. Instead, we need to be seeking happiness where it can be found, in Jesus Christ, in God, the creator of the universe. He is the fountainhead of all happiness. And then there are the lower streams of happiness that C.S. Lewis spoke of that we experience down here. And what we need to do to really enjoy those in the way that we're intended to enjoy them, to not turn them into idols, is to trace them back to where they came from so that we look from them to Him. God is the source of all that is good. God is the source of all that makes us happy. He is the fulfiller of our dreams. To see his face will be to be in relationship with the creator of the universe. Scripture talks about the master who welcomes his servant and says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's happiness. A happiness that predated the creation of the world itself. A happiness that has existed always in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God says, not just go find your happiness somewhere, but enter into my happiness, my delight in my creation, my delight in myself, my delight in you as my children. Apart from the new earth, just talk about the city and how many 
stories this city could have and how big it is. Give us an example of the dimensions. Well, with this 1,400 miles, uh, if you had uh, uh, layers, stories that were 12 feet high, something like 600,000 stories, I mean, I don't necessarily think that it's going to be built just that way. Uh, some people say, well, maybe at the top it actually comes up so it's more of a pyramid. Maybe it looks this way, looks that way. But this we know, the amount of square footage is beyond comprehension. And that's just there in the New Jerusalem. We've got the whole new earth, but that's not all. We've got the whole new solar system, the whole new galaxy. If there is a new Jerusalem and there is a new earth, why not a new solar system and a new galaxy and many new galaxies? Because we're told God creates a new heavens and a new earth. Well, the heavens are the celestial heavens, not just the sky, but the whole universe is remade. Will we explore those galaxies in the ages to come? I think it's very likely we will. Think of what we could do right now if all human beings, instead of using 10% of their brains, used 100% of their brains and got together and, and collaborated scientifically. We've already been to the moon. We could already land on Mars if we chose to. What could we do if we weren't subject to sin and suffering and death and could together work toward glorifying God and exploring this universe? All right, this is great stuff, folks. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the new city of Jerusalem, the new earth, and uh, we're going to even talk a little bit more about how we're going to travel. How are we going to get together for gatherings and how are we going to worship God? Stick with us. We'll be right back. If you would like to have all of the information in our series, What Will Heaven Be Like? with our guest, Dr. Randy Alcorn, the three television programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of only $39. And you may order these informative programs now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking about heaven with Dr. Randy Alcorn. He's one of the leading authorities in our country on this. And Randy, I want to talk about the, the topic of the streets of gold in heaven. Are there really streets of gold in the New Jerusalem? We're told that there are, and some people say, well, that's just a figure of speech. Uh, it just means that, hey, gold's the most valuable thing, and there it is on the streets, and people are actually walking on it. It's sort of maybe a, a demeaning reference to d don't put your hope on what you're going to walk on you know, in eternity. And, and maybe there is some truth to that, but I think it's just saying there's no end to the value of what God is going to put into that place. The precious stones, 12 precious stones that we're told are inlaid into the walls of the new Jerusalem. And I think we'll just be surrounded by the beauty of those things. Gold is beautiful. Just even apart from will we need it for its financial value? No. Will it have financial value? Probably not. The point is it's beautiful and God made it. And I think this is what we see in the New Jerusalem. We have the, the, the mineral wonders. We have the natural wonders of vegetation, trees and fruit. We've got mountains. We've got animals. The joy and pleasure of that. I think with animals, for instance, of otters, you know, even here in this life under the curse, I have watched otters play, and I've watched them play for, they, they will just go on for hours and hours. Pretty much all they do is eat and play, which sounds like a pretty good life, I guess, but uh, you know, just the idea of all that fun they have. Now, Romans 1 tells us that God has revealed His attributes in His creation. That means when we look at an otter having fun, playing, then we need to say, God is a playful God. This did not come from Satan. Do, do we think that Satan created otters? Of course he didn't. I mean, in other words, we should see God in this. And so there are delightful things with my golden retriever when she is just 
wants me to rub her ears and she is so delighted and I look into her eyes I see a wonder and I see the God that created that wonder and it's not that the world is full of all these minor important things and who really even cares about that God only cares about the spiritual stuff no God is the maker of all these things physical and spiritual and we will be able to enjoy them without suffering without death for all eternity to his glory right along that line let's talk about the relationship of worship to the other things that we do we've got this idea that worship is over here at the church and the fact is when we're actually working or playing baseball or going golfing or or something else some other activity that that's not worship so the fun part of life is not worship okay you say that's not biblical Join this together. 1 Corinthians 10 31 tells us whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. That means I don't just go to church to the glory of God. I don't just study the Bible to the glory of God. I don't just sing a hymn to the glory of God or pray to the glory of God. What's more ordinary than eating and drinking? And when I walk, when you get up, when you rise, up when you lay down at night life is full and all that is in our life is to be to the worship and honor and praise of God even in this life a theology professor challenged me on something where I had said on the new earth who knows maybe we'll ride bicycles to the glory of God he said Randy if we can see God why would we care about bicycles and I say well it's not that we don't, it's not that we're making bicycles idols that we're worshiping instead of God. On the contrary, we are worshiping God as we enjoy the bicycle. Right now, I go on the Springwater Corridor Trail in Portland and I ride for miles and miles and I worship God. Even me in the world under a curse, even me as a sinner right now, I worship God as I ride my bike. Well, if we can't worship God riding bikes, we shouldn't be riding them now. In eternity, I think we'll worship God in all that we do. Will there be times where we simply gaze at Him and fall on our knees? Absolutely. But we're also told His servants will serve Him. That means we'll be doing other things and going other places, but we'll never be separated from God. We'll never be We'll never lose our sense of the presence of God the way we do sometimes in this life. He is everywhere present even now, but we lose sight of that. We'll never lose sight of that. We will see the giver behind every gift all the time. Will God give us the ability to, to travel back in time and to actually look at His providence, to look at how He guarded us, to look at how He led us? Hmm. How do you see that happening? We know that God is not limited by space and time. He exists outside of space and time. Space and time are actual creations of His for finite creatures to live within. But God, the God of the supernatural and miraculous, can certainly, if He chooses, take us out of where we are in the future, uh, living on the new earth, and He could either allow us to see and study uh, almost in a video sort of way what happened back then to study history and to see his providence in history or if he wanted to he could transport us uh, invisibly to show up and actually behold Jesus speaking to his disciples have you ever wished I have that I could have been there when Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount Maybe one day I will be there as he was giving the Sermon on the Mount because God could take us back. And I also think that that verse in Ephesians 2.7 uh, suggests that this sort of thing could happen because it says, in the ages to come, God will be revealing to us the riches of his kindness and his grace to us in Christ Jesus. Yes, the grace and kindness that will come in the ages to come, but I also think that were manifest to us in ages past. So he could take us back to our lives. We might be able to go back and witness something that was a, a terrible car accident, uh, whatever the trauma might have been, and be able to now see it through his eyes and say, 
Lord, so that is what you were doing. When you promised you would cause all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, that's what you were doing in my life. By Right now, we have to take that by faith. One day, our faith will become sight. In retrospect, I think, we'll be able to look back and see the grace and kindness of God in our lives and His purpose. If we have a loved one that dies without Christ and goes to hell, will we be sad in heaven because we know they went to hell? Well, this is a question that people ask a lot. And I grew up in a non-Christian home. I know what it's like to be in that context. I still have a, a loved one who doesn't know the Lord, and I have numbers of friends that don't know the Lord. So I, I understand the reasoning behind that, and it's a little hard for us to comprehend. But we do see this. We see in the book of Revelation, angels and people in heaven who are rejoicing over God's judgment on the wickedness of the earth. And when he brings death and destruction, people actually rejoicing because of the manifestation of God's holiness. Now, when it comes to people that we have loved, I think we need to understand that God loves them so much he went to the cross for them. But certainly heaven will never be trumped by hell. Hell will have no power over heaven. The joys of heaven will never be diminished by the reality of hell. And I actually think in the ages to come, hell will be but a footnote to the unfolding drama of redemption in terms of what God has done in His people and what He will do in the ages to come. We will not be obsessed by that, and no, I don't think it will rob us of our joy. For people that want to know Christ, in 30 seconds, how can they come to know Christ personally so they can know for sure they're going to heaven? You need to see Jesus for who He is and yourself for who you are. The fact that you are separated from God, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. To come into a relationship with God, you must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, realizing He has paid the price for your sin. That's the only way you can come into relationship with God. Next week, folks, Randy is a best-selling author of How You Explain Heaven to Your Children. And we're going to do a program where we're going to help you to answer the questions of your children or your grandchildren. What are the questions they ask about heaven? The topic of heaven comes up many, many times and there's a lot of bad answers that adults, even Christian adults, give to their kids. We're going to talk about the big questions that kids ask and we're going to ask Randy to explain how you can tell them what God is saying. I hope that you'll join us then. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. As we close today, if you would like to have all of the information in our new series, Heaven, What Will It Be Like? with Dr. Randy Alcorn, it's available now on DVD. In this series, he describes what the great city of New Jerusalem looks like, and how the city will be at the center of heaven on earth. You'll learn that this city is 1,400 miles in length, width, and height. This means the ground level of the New Jerusalem is nearly 2 million square miles. How big is it? That's 40 times bigger than England, 15,000 times bigger than London. It's 10 times as big as France or Germany and is far larger than India. And that's just the ground level. If the city consists of different levels and each story is 12 feet high, the city could have over 600,000 stories. But most amazing of all, God says He will live in this city with us on earth and His presence will be its greatest feature. What will we do in heaven? Will we be able to travel? And how can you biblically answer the questions your children or grandchildren ask you about heaven? Why is it that no one will get into heaven without Jesus? And those who put their trust in Christ, He promises to bring to heaven when they die. But those who do not know Christ, their place is in hell. The three programs in this fascinating series are available on DVD for a gift of $39.
Then we taped a second series with Dr. Randy Alcorn entitled, What's So Exciting About Heaven? It's available now on DVD. You know, many Christians seem to have the idea that heaven is one long church service after another. It doesn't sound like good news to them. Rather, it sounds like eternal boredom. But the Bible assures us that heaven is a real place, just like New York, London, or Rio de Janeiro. How does the Bible describe heaven now? And in the future, what will heaven be like when God brings the city of New Jerusalem down from the invisible realms and places it on a perfectly renewed earth? What will it be like for us to live in real resurrected bodies and eternally enjoy the friendship of people we love in a beautiful world filled with breathtaking gardens and rivers and mountains and much more? What kind of home will we live in? Will we actually see God? The three programs in this series are also available on DVD for a gift of $39. Then third, we're making available two new study guides with extensive notes that parallel our two television series and therefore your personal study or Bible study group. Each study guide is available for a gift of $8 or for five or more copies for $5 each. And fourth, how to know with absolute certainty that you are going to heaven. This is a 182-page book that Dr. John Weldon and I co-authored. We believe there's no more important topic than this, and our book is available for a gift of $10. And then finally, if you would like to have all of these materials together, that is the two television series, Heaven, What Will It Be Like? Plus, What's So Exciting About Heaven? Plus, the two study guides on heaven, plus our book, How to Know with Absolute Certainty that You Are Going to Heaven, all five of these items are available together in a special package for only $99. And you may order the special package now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. 3030. Or you may also order these materials at our website at jashow.org, where we have a secure place for you to order these materials. Next week on the John Ankerberg Show. Children are inquisitive and they believe what God says because the Bible says there's a heaven and they want to know what it's like, what's going on there, what's it going to be like for them.